Hello and welcome to Odds and Ends Part 8. In this episode we'll cover the history of seaweed propagation. The common seaweeds being produced are red seaweed, brown seaweed, and some green seaweed, but the red and brown are the most common. The red seaweeds are part of the genus Piporia, and the brown seaweeds are in the genus Saccharina and Udraria. The primary mode of reproduction for the green and red seaweeds are asexual reproduction via meal spores, making them easy to mass propagate. Kelps or green seaweed on the other hand do not regenerate from pieces or from meal spores. They have a sexual part to their life cycle. The asexually propagated species are cultivated by vegetative propagation based on chunks of the seaweed itself which is divided up and propagated asexually. Now on to the history of this process and the optimization of mass-producing plants. It was discovered in the brown seaweed species Saccharina latisma, revealed that by changing the temperature or by chopping up a part of the seaweed called a phallus, it can cause the seaweed to release massive amounts of neospores, which can be used to generate a legion of asexual spawn. It was also found that the use of red light can prevent sexual propagation from happening in brown seaweed as well. And the production of sexual embryos through fertilization is triggered by white light. During the early periods of propagation, the spores of the seaweed are attached to ropes which are kept wet in seaweed nurseries. Once the young seaweeds achieved a size of 1 to 2 millimeters, they are then moved to open water. This process can take up to 8 months. It was later discovered, however, that certain textile sheets can double the growth rate of all four types of spores, including meospores, gametophytes, and sporophytes. It was also discovered how to asexually propagate sporophytes, which grow even faster than meospores and gametophytes. In such genera such as Galserina, which produce almost fully grown propagules, and the genus Campophilus and Uchima, which can be propagated on tissue culture systems, even faster biomass production has been created. Later on, a new method called the tubular net method, modeled after the mollusk farms, was used to replace ropes, improving the amount of seaweed propagules you can add onto a piece of rope mass. And it's better for the environment since the seaweed does not invade the current environment. It's also very efficient in fast growing species because side branches will quickly grow out of the mesh in a very quick fashion. And this will happen before, this can happen before sediment overgrowth or epiphyte overgrowth depending on the area can happen. However, However, the seaweeds are still subject to natural disasters such as typhoons and storms, which can damage or destroy entire crops. The only solution to that problem would be growing them in tanks, which we'll cover right now. Growing seaweed on land is a very difficult process, since the cost of keeping sea lanes in tanks is very expensive and lays with difficulties such as acclimation pressures and possible disease control. The first example of on-land managed seaweed cultivation is Irish moss or Chandra's Crippus aquaculture in Charlesville, Nova Scotia, Canada. The various problems that need to be overcome included improving photosynthetic rates, reducing zinc contamination, disease control, and cultivar selection. To that end, the company that produced Irish moss within a tank Utilize drone monitoring, real-time adjustments of air delivery systems, compressed air agitation in each tank, continuous alteration of pH using carbon dioxide, with carbon recovery up to 90% in large-scale cultivation tanks. Issues with water pipelines were solved by accessing deeper and cooler seawater, which contains low M levels of sediment. Various measures were developed to improve mechanical sorting and handling techniques to improve the efficiency of seaweed production in such a situation, with most of the seaweed being imported to Japan. 
To this end, extensive work in CV breeding, biology, mechanical engineering, and marketing were done to make this plan a possibility. In more recent years, a new system was developed called the Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture System, or IMTA. Through the use of this system, seaweed-based farms on a full scale have achieved commercial success in areas such as China, South Africa, and Canada, and more recently, Israel. As of right now, very few species have been optimized to the system, with the species of the Galserina genus and Ova genus being two such examples, with these species having been fully analyzed for optimal growth, optimal light intensity, temperature, water motion, plant density, nutrient enrichment, and genetics. Such technologies have also been used to improve, to develop systems for other aquaculture projects. For instance, one such Grasserinia species was bred and developed for the function of acting as a biofilter for fish poop in aquaculture systems. As such, the integration of the IMTA system into other fish farms has also improved the production of fish in land-based operation. With the species Ulva lactua, they've reduced the amount of nitrogen within sea urchin tanks and fish ponds. As such, in land-based fish pond and sea urchin farms, the cultured seaweed assimilated 74% of the nitrogen from said fish ponds and sea urchins, and the seaweed could be used as a food source for the sea urchins, further improving the efficiency of land-based systems for fish farming. A similar phenomenon was also found in fish. Now onto the history of disease control within seaweed culture. One of the biggest problems in production of kelp and other seaweed species are the infections by various umai seeds such as Pythium and Olaplopsis as well as red rot and other diseases, which spreads quickly in large-scale populations. In smaller operations, people can do regular acid washing techniques to prevent or reduce the growth of these pathogens. Similarly, other species such as epiphytes, herbivores, and other strange substances can cause losses for seaweed production facilities. Drying and pH control can be used in Pythopora, or the red seaweed, as well as increasing the density of seaweed to minimize the presence of epiphytes. Later discoveries such as the extracts of different brown seaweeds can trigger immune responses within other seaweeds that alter the growth of different seaweed species, making them more resilient against different problems such as epiphyte and abiotic stresses. These biostimulants seem to act as a trigger for the immune response and as a growth promoter within various species of seaweed. As of right now, this has only been seen in the Capacaeus genus of seaweed. The mechanism is an interaction between the beta-1 free glucan found in such extracts and the beta-1 free gluconase enzyme present in the Capophycus species. Well, that about covers everything. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching this video. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to me on BitChute for a greater variety of content. Four videos a week. And thank you to all my subscribers on both platforms. I appreciate it.